Hi guys, how are you? Welcome to the Fiber Nymph Dye Works channel. My name is Lisa, also known as Fiber Nymph, and today is Sunday, October 29th. We are almost, not only to the end of October, but almost to Halloween. And that is the more exciting aspect of that to me. I love Halloween. I love Halloween. Are you guys like spooky season as soon as it hits September 1st? That's what I am, so. Anyway, um, here we are. And I just wanted to mention to you, you may see my husband walking back and forth over here to the right. There's a light on, the dining room light's on. You might see that also. Um, he has a whole bunch of stuff spread out on the dining room table. I don't really know what all it is, paperwork, um, but I just told him just please don't open the porch room door and everything's good. You can do whatever else you want out there. But anyway, you may see him pass by. I don't know. He's currently distracted by something on his computer in his office. So who knows? He could be there for hours before he remembers there's stuff all over the table. <laughs> anyway. Before I begin, uh, just to remind you, if you are new here, actually it's not to remind you if you're new here, if you're new here, welcome, and to let you know, if you're a returning viewer, it's a reminder that I do put show notes in the drop-down menu below the um, video on YouTube in the description box. I also post them in our Ravelry group, as well as on my uh, blog on the Fiber Nymph Dye Works website. So you can find show notes everywhere. I include links to all of my project pages, both on Ravelry, as well as on my own personal project blog, which is called um, My Favorite Day. So there's links to everything, and if I didn't link something or didn't give you enough information, feel free to leave a question in the comments below or in any of those other locations, and I will be happy to respond and give you all the details. So, um, it is a very gloomy, rainy Sunday here, and I didn't put the heat on because I'm wearing a very warm sweater, which I am going to tell you about in just one moment because honestly, I don't have a whole lot of other announcements or intro stuff to tell you. However, I will point out that you might notice there's a little bin sitting here on this chair. Um, it's a yarn bin. It does not have yarn in it. Here, I'll show you what is currently in it. Hey, little dude. How you doing? Yeah, you might be thinking, if you have been around here, oh, did the cats bring something else in? Well, ironically, no. Emma and I brought him in. <laughs> um, he was outside, out front yesterday. And it's a shrew, by the way, it's not a mouse. Um, not that that matters, it's a little critter. Um, Bill had been looking out the window yesterday morning, and he's like, oh, what does Babette have? He's, she's doing something. So he went out and looked, and he had seen that she had like a little critter that she was sort of stalking and chasing. She hadn't caught it, um, but he brought her in. He's like, just stay in here for a while. Just And she did. She fell asleep. So this little guy was not bothered, but later on in the day, he wasn't home, and Emma was out on the front porch, and she saw him, and he was under my car, and if I can get the video from her, she has video on her phone, um, I'll try to put it in here, but if not, just imagine this little guy sitting under my car, running in little tiny circles, to the left, only to the left. He was doing it nonstop, super fast, left, 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 and then he'd stop, and he'd be really out of breath, and his little heart rate was going like crazy, <laughs> you know, and then he would start up again, and he might, might move over a foot or so, but he was always going to the left, and we watched him for, I mean, 20 minutes he was doing this, plus however long he'd been doing it before we noticed, and I said, oh my gosh, like, he can't be right out here doing this, like, the cats come out here all the time, he's going to be somebody's snack. I said, I don't know if he's hurt. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So I said, Emma, go in and get the critter container. If you don't know, we keep a plastic, that the smaller container that was in the big container, we keep that up on top of our, um, our oven, <laughs> our, our cabinet where the oven is, um, just so that we can catch the little critters that the cats usually bring in, you know, instead of the other way around, us bringing them in. So we got him. He was very easy to catch since all he was doing and was running in a little circle. And I brought him in and then I put him in this bigger bin too because I wasn't sure how much shrews can like jump. 
mice can really jump high and I didn't want to like have an extra problem of him being loose in the house. That's also why he's out here because if he does get loose out here, he's in a contained unit. He can't get into the main part of the house where the cats are. So anyway, I gave him a little bit of water. I gave him some sunflower seeds and he has just been happy as a clam. Um, put in like an old hand knit dishcloth. That's what was in there for him to have something to like burrow into if he gets cold because we don't heat this room generally um, unless I'm out here working, but I don't even have the heat on today. So anyway, he and I was like fingers crossed because a lot of times when I try to rescue small animals, they just die. <laughs> I don't have a good track record, but I try. And you know, part of me thought, well, I could just put him over here, like in the woods area and hope that he can find some place to, you know, hunker down. But obviously I don't know where his actual hovel or home or tunnel or whatever shoes live in. I don't know where that's at. And he probably has a store of food somewhere because everybody's getting ready for winter. So I just left him in here. And this morning we checked on him and He's fine and he sits there the way he did in the video. I kind of hoped he would move a little bit, but he's still, anytime he moves, it's to the left. I don't know, even when he's sitting still, his head's just kind of tilted to the left. Emma and I are just convinced that he's broken, like something, and I don't think it's anything bad that did to him because she, there was no other marks on him. He didn't look, you know, sometimes when the cats catch something, even if they don't hurt them, like. They have slobber marks on them, you know what I mean? So I don't know. Um, we may just have a temporary new pet for as long as this little guy lives because the weather's turning really crappy this week. I don't want to just set him free. So I don't know. He's here. He's happy. I've given him food. He has water. He's got a place to stay where the cats aren't going to bother him. So, you know, it's life here at the mountain house. Always something. Anyway, all right, let's get on with the podcast now that we're done talking about tiny little mammals. I do have some tea this afternoon. This is some lavender mint tea that I got in a little tiny bottle. It was part of a Christmas gift I actually got like maybe two years ago. So it's been sitting around for a while. Um, I made this with, I put some just stevia leaves in it. So it tastes very good and it's nice and toasty. And I've showed you this mug before, but I'll show you again because it's of the season. We've got the mushrooms and the pumpkins. I just love this little mug. I've been using it a ton. I've got like three mugs. I think I maybe talked about that the last, did I? I don't remember. Did I talk about my three mug rotation right now? This one, my skull mug that used to be my Monday mug and my um, witch please mug that a friend of mine gave me <laughs> recently. That's been my rotation for mugs this fall. It's been great. Oh, I'm also wearing these earrings. They're spiders. <laughs> Emma gave me these for Christmas a couple years ago. They've got little amethyst chips and a little spider. So, you know, I'm totally in the season. I redid my hair this morning, so I'm freshly purple for the holiday. And I have my finished Duchesne. That's what we're going to talk about first because it's my first finished object. And I could not be happier with this sweater. Um, I did not take the time to film ahead of time, um, so I am going to just stand up and back up a little bit so you can just see it in its finished form. I know you saw it um, briefly before, before it was, before, before, <laughs> before when it was not totally finished, but let's get a good view of it. Okay, hang on a sec. Ta-da! I'm so happy with this sweater. The sleeves are actually the same length. I think it's just how I have it on my body that they might look a little off. But here it is. I love it. I love it! Um, here is the feather and fan detail that runs down the front. It opened up really nicely with blocking. And here's the sleeves, and I'll show you now while I'm standing the sleeve detail that I did at the bottom of the sleeves. Um, we're gonna come back to that, so just you can look at it, but it's the same edging that's at the bottom of the sweater, so. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. I know I've talked about it a lot in recent episodes, but I'm gonna try to just 
encapsulate everything in a in one uh, one place here now. So this is the Duchesne. The pattern is by excuse me Layla Raven, and the yarn that I used is some Cascade 220 in the colorway Tangerine, which was number 9444. And as far as I know, that is a discontinued colorway. I got this yarn, uh, I adopted it from my friend Carol, who is the host of the A Stitch in Time podcast. Um, and I am so grateful to her for letting me take this yarn off of her hands because it's a perfect sweater for me. So anyway, and this is my color, I love this color. Love this color of orange. Okay, so let me tell you the details. I knit, now, first of all, you have to know, I pretty much modified the pattern from the get-go because number one, it was written for a linen yarn. This is not linen. This is a worsted weight wool yarn, right? Okay, so that was the first big change. And I knew I was going to have to accommodate for that change in some of the way I made it because the linen would have been extremely drapey. Even in the pattern picture, you can just see the drape of that linen. It's beautiful. Um, I knew that was gonna be a challenge to replicate in wool. Um, so that's why I did some of the things that I did, but we'll, we'll get to that as we go along. Okay, so needle size. The pattern I do believe called for a nine. Um, I went down to an eight because I generally, if I'm if I'm knitting Cascade 220 and I want to have a nice firm gauge, I usually would use a six, maybe a seven. Um, but I didn't want a firm gauge, so I went down to an eight. A nine would have just been way too open. So this was also written to be knit in two pieces, the front and then the back, and then have everything seamed up, you know, up the sides and the shoulders. I knit the top part of the front and the top part of the back flat and then joined in the round once I hit to my, hit my you know armhole join point okay I think it was around nine inches um, and then I knit the rest of it in the round and that worked out great um, I did seam the shoulders before I finished the body just because it was easier without both halves of the top flipping around so they were seamed together um, I did measure to see how far in I was going to want it um, like I pinned it just to see how far I was going to want my neck opening so and then I seamed it all right so then I got to the bottom and I told you last time um, my little issues that I ended up having with doing the hemline because I ended up with that real flary out issue because the pattern did not specify to change needle sizes for doing the hem I ended up going down to a seven for the first couple of rounds, I don't know, maybe two, three or four rounds of the hemline. Um, and then I changed to a six before I um, did the last couple rows and the band off. And that seemed to work great. The other thing I incorporated in, as I told you, was I put decreases. Um, I put two decreases here and here and here and here. So I did a series of eight decreases across the front essentially in order to keep that where it was flaring a little more under control and that worked perfectly. Um, the back laid really nice as it was. Um, when, when I turned around, hopefully you were able to see the slight curvature on the back. I did that, that wasn't part of the pattern. The pattern is written to be flat or straight across the back. I wanted to kind of mimic that little uh, curve that I get at the bottom of the front you know, from the feather and fan. So I did a series of short rows to do that little curve and it worked out great. Um, and, you know, like I said, the way I did it after I, when I did the hem the second time going down in needle sizes and adding the decreases, it really did take care of any flaring. So I was thrilled that that worked out well. So when you saw it last, I was working on the first sleeve. I made an interesting life choice in choosing to do the sleeves on a seven. Now, you may or may not know that anytime you're knitting in the round, when you're knitting a smaller circumference in the round, your stitches are always gonna be tighter as opposed to when you're knitting a larger circumference. So sweater body versus sleeve. Almost everybody I know ends up having a chain, a difference, you know, it's a little tighter. So seeing as I did the whole body on an eight, the fact that I went down onto a seven for the sleeves, I'm not sure why I made that choice, but I did and it worked out fine. Oh, I will say though, this stockinette portion at the top of the sweater in the back and then on the sides here, there's a definite noticeable difference um, from this versus the gauge of 
the same areas lower down. I mean, you can visibly see that. And that is because I was working flat versus in the round and I definitely knit tighter in the round. I could have mitigated that issue by doing my pearl rows when I was knitting flat with a size smaller needle. I usually do that when I'm knitting, um, you know, flat. I just didn't think about it this time. And again, it's not a big deal. It fits great. But anyway, um, the first sleeve, I believe, was my right sleeve. And it, as I was knitting it, I noticed, yes, it is tighter. But I thought, you know what? It's fine. I'm not worried about it. Um, I'm just going to go with it. And so I planned to do the sleeves concurrently. Um, so I worked the first one. I picked up the stitches, worked down until I had done all of the decreases that I wanted to do, which may have been the point where I talked to you last and showed it to you. Um, so I had done like a series of eight decreases every fifth round um, to get it to where it was. So then I stopped and I picked up stitches over here. Now, here's the thing. I was working with my Licka interchangeable needles and I have both the long tips and the short tips. So I was working with the long tips and a longer cable on this first sleeve. And I thought, you know what, rather than playing around and taking the tips off and putting them on another cable, I'm just gonna use my short tips of the same size, same US 7s, to do the second sleeve. And that's what I did. I did choose a shorter cable than the one I had been using over here, but it worked fine. I did the magic loop. It was great. So I did the left sleeve, same way, eight, you know, picked up the stitches, eight decreases and then I counted and realized that I had fewer stitches on this sleeve than on this sleeve by four and it dawned on me that I picked up four fewer stitches <laughs> on the second sleeve. I hadn't written the number down. I was just going by memory because I had just done it not long ago. I thought, oh, I know what I did. Clearly I didn't. So I was not going to rip the whole sleeve out. I just I ripped back the last two decrease amount and then I just started knitting straight from there. I figured you're not really going to be able to tell. And honestly, you can't tell that much from that. Um, I, there's something else I'm going to tell you about the sleeves in a minute. But anyway, when I got to the bottom, um, I knit, I basically knit as long as I wanted it. And as you could see when I was standing, like, it's, um... Uh, like there's the bottom. Okay. So what is that called? Three quarter length? I think it's probably th three quarter length. I knew I did not want the cuffs to be down as far as where the hem was on the sweater because then it would just look straight across. And I don't always feel like that's a great look on me. So the sleeves either need to be longer or shorter. And I went for shorter. So I knit that far on, and then I did the edge, which I, again, I just used the edge from the sweater. And then I did the same thing over here edge the sweater, it was done. Um, and then I was looking, I had the sweater laid out flat on the bed. I'm like, that sleeve is tighter than this sleeve. And it was just a matter of four stitches. So I knew that that could not be it. Um, Cause I measured laying flat, the smaller sleeve was about a half inch shorter, which meant there was one inch um, shorter all around circumference wise. And four stitches was not gonna count for that. What I realized, and this was very interesting to me, and I think I was even cognizant of it as I was knitting, because as I said, when I did the second sleeve, I used my shorter tips and a shorter cable. I was still able to do magic loop with it, but with those things being shorter, specifically the tips, because I realized I hold longer tip needles differently than I hold shorter tip needles. When you only have like three inches to hold, you know, the way you hold them is very different than the way you would hold a larger tip because you have a lot more to hold on to. So I am fairly certain that that difference and possibly the shorter cable too could have had something to do with it because I'd have to, I had to manage the stitches a little differently, but definitely the needle tips I think had to do with why that sleeve ended up being a smaller circumference. And I had just never thought about that. I'd never encountered that. I'm really half tempted to try like magic looping two socks that way, like with larger needles and smaller needles, just to see, like just to see if that same thing would happen. I may not, cause I don't want to mess with it, but that's my, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. In the end, it means nothing. The only way I can really tell is you can see the right one 
does hang down a little bit more than the left one. When I was blocking, I did try to stretch this one out a little bit, um, but I didn't want to compromise length either. And when you do that, if you stretch it wide, it's going to get shorter. So I just didn't worry about it. And honestly, I can't tell when it's on and it's not a sweater that I'm ever going to be rolling the sleeves up because they're already short enough. I don't need to push them up for anything. Now, the other interesting thing to this was when I was finished with the sleeves, the only thing I had left to do was take care of the neckline, which you'll remember, it just sort of was rolling out because it was just stuck in it and then this, this lacy bit here. So it rolled. And honestly, it looked fine. It was actually pretty, it was very pretty to me. I don't usually like rolled necklines, but or rolled hems or anything that's not my my jam usually but when I was trying it on I was super tempted to just leave it as it is the only reason I didn't was because it did not have very much stability at all and it really wanted to pull open so I knew that finishing the neckline would help mitigate that and it did but funny part to this is that when I went to the pattern to see what to do for the neckline, I was looking at the sleeve instructions and they were not what I did. And then I looked at the picture and realized that this edging is not on the sleeves according to the pattern. I don't know why I thought it was. I just assumed it was. Um, and I hadn't looked at the pattern. Go figure. Um, and I hadn't looked at the picture recently. The, it's just straight stockinette sleeves and they're quite tight. Um, and that was the other thing. The pattern had ha said to pick up one stitch for every row of the sweater. And I knew that would be way too many stitches. So I picked up two for every three rows and that worked out great. Even if I did four fewer on this side than this side, just because I did it wrong, but whatever. Um, and then I looked at another part of the pattern as I was looking at the picture, there was a pattern note, which again, go figure, I did not read that. Um, and it did note that the reason that they were having you pick up those, all of those stitches, one for every row was because you were working it in linen and linen is gonna want to come together um, and it's gonna make a very slim tube. And if you make it too small, you're gonna feel like your arms being strangled. So, it made total sense and it vindicated me for like doing my pickup differently. I, I did it right for the yarn that I was using. Um, however, like the pattern was just saying your, your sleeves are just going to end up being these very elastic stockinette tubes. That's how it's meant to be bind off, you know, loosely so that they don't cut you off at the bottom. Um, but I honestly, I love this edging on it. And I think it's kind of fun because it does this, it's almost like a, bell sleeve kind of thing, which again, that's not normally my jam, but I think it's really pretty on here. So anyway, the neckline was super easy. And that was, I think the only thing out of the entire pattern that I did according to the pattern, <laughs> just had you pick up one stitch for every stitch, you know, each, each of your cast on stitches, you picked up the whole way around. And then the next time around, all you did was bind them off. The bind off was a knit two together through the back loop. And then you slip that stitch back on your left needle and you just do that the whole way around. I don't know that I've ever done a bind off like that before. Um, it does though add a good deal of stability. I don't think, for me, I don't think it's a stretchy bind off. Like it, it's a very nice bind off and I'm going to keep that in my arsenal for things whenever I do need to like tighten up a neckline or something, that might be a really good option. So that's it. I wove in all the ends. I blocked it. Um, it dried really fast that day because <laughs> the pellet stove was running downstairs and now it's done. I will say it's a very warm sweater. So if I wasn't sitting out here in this unheated room, I probably would be dying of heat stroke right now because it's kind of warm, even though it's rainy. Um, yeah, but it's going to be a great sweater. Um, I just have a little tank top cami underneath it. Um, and you can, I can put different colors under it too. And it'll probably be very different. This is a gray one. I could put a black one on. I could put like a cream colored one on. I could put some crazy color on purple. Put a purple one on. You never know. Anyway, super happy with this pattern. I would totally make this pattern again. Matter of fact, I would love to make it again, maybe out of like a linen or a hemp or a cotton or something like that, just to have a totally different experience with it. So anyway, but this is my big finished object. And again, thrilled with it. 
Um, it, it is definitely one of the best pullovers I've ever made, like the best fitting as well. Um, I got the fit just spot on and I feel like it was totally by accident because <laughs> I didn't swatch, <laughs> just, just winged it, but it turned out great. So yay. Um, sadly I started this just a few days before the pigskin party started. So I cannot count this as one of my pigskin party projects, which was really funny when I was calculating how much yardage I used. Oh, that was the thing I didn't say. I used 400 and I think 35 yards. So just like I, four skeins and then like a third of a skein. This is all I had yet left. This is about 50 grams. Um, the yarn that I got from Carol was not in its all in its original skein form. There was one original skein and then she had frogged a couple of things that she had tried making uh, from it. So they were all different size skeins. Um, but you know, the numbers add up, right? So anyway, yeah, I have 50 grams left. This would be great. I could make a pair of mitts or a hat or something with it maybe. I don't know, but I'm really happy to have been able, A, to use as much of that yarn as I did and to get a full garment out of it. Now, had I made these long sleeves, like full length sleeves, I probably wouldn't have very much left at all. Um, but I'm just so happy. <laughs> I'll stop saying that now. But you know, sometimes when you get something and you just get a really good win of a finished object, it's exciting. And you know, you guys understand that. Okay, let's move on because I do have some other finished objects. Um, the next one is the marled scrappy socks that I was making. I don't remember how far I was. Maybe I had one of them done, um, but I have them both done. I forgot to grab a pair of sock blockers, but here they are. <laughs> so, yep, just two strands of my uh, Mountain Tweed BFL held together. Uh, one of the strands was the just natural plain vanilla colorway, and I held it together with other colors and just kept switching out the other colors as I was running out. So these did count towards my pigskin party. I don't know why. For, sometimes, like, points for things like that really motivate me and other times it doesn't motivate me at all and this is one of the years where I am feeling super motivated <laughs> by points for some reason so anyway um yeah finished pair of socks they used let's see what did I use um exactly 50 grams total so they're 219 yards I used us 2.5s which makes a nice dense fa uh, fabric so they'll be good. I'm going to give these to Emma for Christmas. I think she'll, I think she'll like them as house socks. So anyway, those are finished and I still had mini skeins of mountain tweed sitting around. So I thought, well, let's move on and I will make something else. And so I cast on and have since finished a pair of marled tweedy mitts. Also out of scraps. These I will put on for you. The socks, not so much. <laughs> but yeah. Here they are. And this is just my own pattern, um, the socks as well. It's just my plain vanilla sock pattern my, that I use all the time. Um, and these are a mitt pattern that I actually did start writing up a few years ago and I never finished. I don't know why. I, was, I had sizing issues, whatever. I might write it up at some point, but it's really just a pretty plain recipe kind of thing. Um, you do a lot of measuring of your own hand or the hand of whoever you're making it for. So these used, what did these use? Um, these used, oh, that's not right. I have that the, I think I must have copied and pasted from my socks because I said, oh, these used exactly 50 grams. Too. They did not. They used more. I think these used like 64 or 68 grams. I don't know. It was somewhere in the 60 range, so it was more than the socks, I guess. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does. It, I don't know. Whatever. It's in the project notes. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was just a lot of fun to, you know, get more scrappy leftovers out of my stash. Um, and again, this was the Mountain Tweed BFL. All of this Mountain Tweed BFL was left over from that Granny Stripes vest that I ended up making. It was supposed to be a cardigan turned into a vest. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so there was that. 
My other finished object is one that you did see last time, um, and this is Stephanie Lotvin's Haunt Haunted House Make-Along Cowl. Um, the the make-along ended on the 13th of October, so I'm going to assume probably most people are done. Um, there are still a few days left in October, and I think you, if you want to be in her drawing for prizes or something, um, you need to have posted it by the end of October. I have not posted it anywhere for prizes because I'm not, I don't care about the prizes, but I am going to show you my finished cowl. I did finish it on the, I think I finished it on the 13th. Maybe it was the 14th. I don't know, but I finished it really close to the deadline or to the original end of the make along. And so are you ready? Here we go. Ta-da! It is so cool. I love all these motifs. I would love to make a sweater using some of these motifs. Um, and I may try to improvise that at some point. Although, you know what? I highly bet that Stephanie Lotvin has probably already on that. She's probably already on that. Um, she does that. She reuses motifs from one thing and makes something else. And it's always very cool when she does it. Anyway. So we had 13 days. Um, I told you last time this was the spiders. This was the witch's eyes. Um, these were cauldrons, brooms. Then we get into the color work. These parts were knit flat. And then you join in the round and start doing the color work. So we've got bats. We've got eyeballs. We've got jack-o'-lanterns. These were vampire teeth. They're kind of hard to tell because I didn't have a huge high contrast in that one. Um, the ghosties I love. This is the same ghosties from her um, Boneyard Sweetheart sweater, I think, or hat last year. She does have a sweater out now, too. Um, anyway, but that's where those came from, I'm pretty sure. Um, these are oh, tombstones and then poison this was a two-day clue uh, the skull and cross bones for poison and then the um, edging was this fun little lace edging and i don't remember what it was meant to be i want to say it was maybe windows for you to escape from the haunted house through the windows or something so anyway this is the first one of her cows her um, shawl cowls, shawl style cowls that I've ever made. And I'd seen a lot of people showing off other ones over the years. And they're interesting in how you have to wear them. So I'm going to put this on and we'll take a look at that. Okay. I did also watch um, as part of the pattern. I, well, was it part of the pattern? It was actually, I think, in the Ravelry group that she had going for this make-along. She put a little video together of different ways to wear the cowl. Um, and I did watch that. But honestly, <laughs> any way that she wore it or styled it, um, and any way I've seen anybody else style it, you lose a lot of these motifs. They just get all scrunched up. So I think... The best way, like for the color work motifs anyways, to take the top and she showed it like put it on itself like this, which is nice. It does give you extra fabric around your neck. Um, but then like the bats kind of get folded in on still and the pumpkins. And so you're mainly, the one that you're mainly seeing is the poison. And I don't love that that's the one, like I think some of these other ones are cuter, like the bats and the ghosties and the, and, um, the Jack Lanterns. I thought I really like those motifs a little bit better than this one, but you know, it's okay. Um, so oh, I don't even have it straight. Yeah. I, I haven't played with it a whole lot. Anytime she was wearing it too, she was really like yanking it down like this, which I guess does open things up, but I don't feel like that's a super realistic way to wear a cowl because it's not going to stay there as you move around. Now she did show it more like off to the side as well. Oh, my spiders are getting tangled up in it. <laughs> ah, okay, here. This requires removing the earring and seeing what's going on. Okay, that was a thing. <laughs> that was a whole big thing. All right, now I've probably snagged this a little bit. Darn it. 
I'll fix it once I take it off. Anyway, so even turning it sideways though, it doesn't really open everything up at the same time. So, I mean, it's not the end of the world because obviously, I mean, it looks cute and it's colorful. And if you're wearing it under a jacket anyway, nobody's gonna see it and you can, you know, double that up and you definitely are gonna stay warm. However, you know, it would have been fun to be able to just wear it by itself over, you know, a lightweight sweater on a, you know, not frigid day and have all this. So I don't know. I honestly don't know how much wear I will get out of it anyway, just because I don't know, like I'm not going anywhere for Halloween. <laughs> so I don't know. But all that said, I really enjoyed making it. It was a lot of fun. I was knitting it along with a friend of mine. Um, so that made it extra fun too. And yeah, I mean, and it, it did actually, it gave me points for the, the pigskin party. <laughs> um, yeah, what else can I say about it? All of the yarn was my yarn, Fiber Nymph Dye Works yarn. It was all bounce except for the green because I had run out of my green. Um, I didn't have enough left. And so I found some leftovers that I had in the same color, but in bedazzled. So my edge is bedazzled. And then the only other color that wasn't that is this bright dark, well, dark pink one. Um, that was some Miss Babs in a, I think Cassiopeia, I think she named it, I don't know. It was part of a mini set that I had purchased a long time ago. So anyway, um, it's a really fun little motif driven uh, cowl. I can't say that this style of cowl is going to ever be my favorite, but it was a lot of fun and I'm glad I did the, the make along. It was, it was fun to do. I don't have a great track record of finishing make alongs on time. So that was also a win for me. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think that is all of the finished objects. Um, and that actually pretty much left me with nothing that I was specifically working on. That was sort of weird. So last night I was sitting there like, well, now what do I work on? Cause I had just finished the mitts yesterday morning. And so I had to decide since I'd finished the sweater, what sweater was I going to work on next? Cause I do want to do another sweater. And because I'm also still in the midst of very, very busy period, um, I've got a little less than two weeks to go before I have to ship out all the holiday countdown stuff. Um, I decided it would be good to have a project that would be kind of a, a bite-sized project that turns into a big thing. And so I am gonna do, um, I'm gonna work on my Ariana um, cardigan um, that I, I talked about a few podcast episodes ago, um, but they're these little crocheted granny squares that are then edged and seamed together and they, they go on the diagonal like this. So they're like diamonds and then you have to do half half diamonds as well. Um, and this, I believe, this is the one I did last night. You might remember if you watched that episode before, I was having trouble coming up with the right um, hook size to get the gauge that I needed. Um, I'm using some Swans Island sport weight. So it's a very wooly wool. Um, and you'll notice I already have my ends woven in and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but it's a very wooly wool and I really like it. I think these colors are gonna be really fun together. And this is the format that I decided I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do them all the same. I had played with maybe switching things around for some of them, but I'm not gonna do that. I think that would bother me. <laughs> so I'm gonna do them this way. And then the outer edge will be um, a darker gray and that's what's gonna join them all together because that I think that's how it's done. Um, I've heard other people say they didn't do the joining the way she has it written, but it will have one more round around it. So I figured I can work on these in small bits and bites as I go. It doesn't have to be like lugging around, like this got to be quite a bit to carry around. So I mainly worked on it in the bedroom when I had time. But anyway, I can work on these one at a time. And what I think I'm gonna do is I am gonna do all of the rounds separately. So I'm gonna start and I'm gonna do all of this center thing get them all done, and then I'm gonna weave in that little center end. 
And then I'm going to pick up and I will go ahead and do like the purple round on all of them and then weave in the all the ends except the little last one. The reason I'm going to weave those in as I go, doing it that way, I mean I wouldn't have to do it that way to weave in the ends as I go, but that's how I'm going to do it, is because these ends want to just stick together and stick to each other and stick to where you're trying to work as you're working. And I think that's going to drive me crazy because I will say that crocheting with this really sticky wool is not it's not feeling pleasurable to me yet. <laughs> and I really, I like crocheting granny stuff. So I need it to be pleasurable. So I think that's the tactic I'm going to take. I didn't do that on this one, um, but that's how I'm going to do it moving forward. And I think it'll be okay. And I also think doing it one step at a time, doing all of them um, will help me keep, stay motivated to continue along. So that's my plan. I'm going to do the Ariana. Um, the other thing that I showed you last time was my October personal stash yarn challenge yarn and that was some Jinx yarn. Um, that was a sport weight and it was in the abandoned carnival colorway. Um, it's self-striping. I thought, oh yay, that would be fun. Halloween socks. Well, I never started them. And at this point, I feel like I don't really need any more Halloween socks for this year. Halloween's a few days away. Not that I can't wear Halloween socks other points in the year, but I don't really need Halloween socks. Um, and the first quarter challenge in the pigskin party, which was socks, is over in a few days. So I think I'm not going to make those right now. So I'm going to forfeit my my October personal stash yarn challenge. And instead, I'm gonna, um, in a couple of days, November 1st, I'm gonna cast on a different pair of sport weight shorty socks that will qualify for the uh, quarter two challenge, which the theme is nature. So your project somehow has to relate to nature, whether it's the name of the colorway or the pattern or something, you know, it has to relate to nature. And so I'm gonna make a pair of sport weight shorty socks out of this yarn, which this is um, yarn from my Lepidoptera Yarn and Fiber Club that I'm doing right now. And this was my September colorway called Luna Moth. And I, I was so happy with how this dyed up and I really like it. In fact, Sarah, who is PA Knitwit, she watches, she's a member of our group and watches the podcast. She just knit a so pair of socks. I don't think she used her minis, but she did use this and she knit a shorty pair of socks and they're so pretty. I was so happy to see it knit up because I don't knit up samples of my club colorways. I just, I dye them. I know what they're going to look like, but I don't actually knit up the samples. So anyway, that's what I'm going to do. So this will be socks it's not my you know it's not a stash yarn challenge obviously it's brand new yarn but that's what I'm gonna make and um, I think that'll be a lot of fun so that'll be a small project to work on other than that I am planning to start a new spinning project I did decide which one it was gonna be oh I meant to bring the fiber over hang on a second okay I walked right past the little guy and he didn't even stir he's sleeping soundly <laughs> Anyway, so this fiber, this is the Grab Your Flannel colorway, which is my exclusive colorway for the pig skin party this year. Um, and I dyed a skein of it up on a mixed BFL, which I don't think is one of the options that I have in the shop. Um, I mean, if you want it on that, I'm happy to do that. Just message me and I'll do it as a special order. But I really like this base, and so I decided to do it on that. And so I did one braid of this colorway and then I did one braid of what I thought would turn out to be a little bit more red than it is. It's I thought it would be more like this because I had a whole bunch, I forget what I was doing. I had a lot of leftover red dye. I don't remember if it was from dyeing this or something else, but anyway, I had a bunch of leftover red dye and I thought, well, you know what, I'll just do another skein or another braid all in red and um, but it was more diluted and so that's why this one did not turn out to be quite as vibrant or red but I'm still going to use it with it because it definitely coordinates. So my plan for this is I want to do three separate skeins um, that will be a three ply and the first one will have like two 
plies of this and one ply of this. And then the next one, no, that's not right. The first one will be three plies of this. The next one will be two plies of this and one ply of this. The next one will be one ply of this and two plies of this. And then the last one will be three plies of this. That's how it was. <laughs> I had to figure that out. Um, oh, my mom's calling. Hang on a sec. Okay, she hung up before I could get to her. I'll call her right back. <laughs> anyway, um, so that would be four skeins. Four skeins of yarn, right? Yes. Took me a while to think that through. Um, anyway, I have to figure out how to separate all of this to have equal amounts. And that's what's been stumping me. But I figure, okay, the first skein is going to be three of this. And then two of this and then one of, or three of this, then two of this and one of this. So this, I have to have six segments, six equal segments. And then same with this, you know, one piece, two pieces, and then three pieces. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to open these both up and divide them into six equal pieces and spin each one separately as its own single and then ply them as I go. That is my plan. I hope it works out. <laughs> I think it will. I have no idea what I'm going to actually make with that. Um, yeah, no, no clue. I should get some decent yardage. I usually do with BFL, so... Anyway, that's my spinning plan, but I'm not going to start that until November 1st at the earliest. Um, am I? Oh, no, that one I'm not going to start until after the holiday countdown sets are out. Once they're shipped, I will start this because I can't have too many projects going at one time while I am um, still working on all those. So anyway, that is what's coming up. That's really all I have for you. Um, the Stop Shooting on Yourself Make Along is still going on. We're almost to the end of October, so I will announce October prize winners in the first podcast of November. And then November is the last month for the uh, Make Along. You can still join in for the first time if you want to. You're more than welcome to pop in at any time. Um, I've really enjoyed this year's uh, make-along. I've taken part in it, uh, which I don't always do with my own make-alongs, which is weird, but I did. I had my wish list of things, and while I didn't touch tons of stuff on that list, there are other things that I did get done, and that makes me really happy because they were things I really wanted to do. So, um, yeah, so that's going on. And those of you who won prizes in September, um, they should ship out this week. I am sorry it's taken me a little bit longer, but again, the holiday countdown stuff is just like all consuming right now. <laughs> so, um, but they'll, they'll be coming to you soon. Um, I do have a plan for next year's make long and I thought I would just mention it briefly, um, so that you can start thinking about it, especially if maybe you had things, that you wanted to do in this year's that you didn't get to do. Um, maybe it would fit in for next year's. Um, if you were around, oh, I wanna say it was maybe 2018, I had put together a whole folder full of patterns that I wanted to try and tackle that year and I called it my pattern pool, P-O-O-L. Um, and I don't remember how many I, I knit from that, but I remember really liking having that um, to draw from, um, at least in theory, even if it in practice maybe it wasn't as effective as I thought it would be. However, I really like that idea and I also really like the idea of doing that with, um, well, still with, it could still be with patterns, but with yarn. Um, so what we're gonna do is, um, I, I haven't decided on what I'm gonna call it yet, could be the yarn pool, but it could also be fiber. Um, it might just be the make-along pool. I don't know. Jump in the make-along pool. <laughs> I don't know, but the whole idea is for you to go and choose a finite number of things to physically be able to put into like a basket or a bin or a big project bag. Um, for instance, yarns from your stash that you would really, really like to use next year. Um, to put them in there and have that be a place that you can go when you want to start a new project and you can pull from the pool. P-U-L-L -L from the P-O-O-L. 
okay? Now, I am not saying that that's the only yarn you should use in the whole year, but if you have stuff that you know you want to use, um, that would be a place to put it. So when you have time to start new projects, maybe pick one from there if you want a smaller project. Or it could be sweater lots. Maybe you have like four sweater lots of yarn that you would absolutely like to pull and, and use next year. You can do that. You can add things to the pool through the year. You can take things out and switch them for other things. Whatever works for you. You can do it with your fiber. You could do it with patterns. You could do it with, um, if you're a sewer, fabric, or if you have other crafts that you want to do, you can put those all in there. Maybe you have some embroidery projects or some um, uh punch needle, you know, that, punch needle, whatever, whatever it is, um, put it in your pool. Um, but I would say keep it between like 12, I would say between 12 and 24 things at a time, um, just to keep it manageable so it's not like you're just moving your entire stash into one place, because um, your entire stash may already be in one place. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's what the gist of it's going to be. I'm open to input and suggestions about that. So if you have any thoughts, please let me know. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about that. I will be starting a thread about that in the Ravelry group, and I will put a post about it in the Fiber Nymph Dye Works blog as well. Um, I'm gonna say that that will probably start in January. Um, yeah, I'm going to say it's probably going to start in January. Oh, you could also put in, like, if you have a lot of whips, maybe put the whips in your in your pool, you know, or have that be some of the things to finish up some whips. A lot of you know that I often use January as my, like, um, finishing month for whips that have been sitting around. So I haven't decided if I'm going to do that next year or not. But it may be part of my pool. I don't know yet. So anyway, I'd love to have your feedback on that. Tell me what you think. Um, and we'll talk about it more in coming weeks. So anyway, that's pretty much all I have for you. I don't have any big shop news going on. Um, I did do a not going to Rhinebeck flash sale last weekend. So if you were on the newsletter or on social media, you probably saw about that. Um, and if you shopped from that, thank you so much. There's still some stuff up from that because I did add a bunch of Dyer's secret stash in the shop last weekend. A lot of it sold, but I think there are still a few things up there from that. Um, right now, my big goals are A, get the holiday countdown sets all finished up and shipped. Um, I would love to do them prior to the deadline date because the deadline date I set from that I set in the listing was November 10th. I didn't realize that is um, Veterans Day weekend that weekend and so there is no mail going out on Saturday the 10th and so I think there's still mail going on the 9th though. So I'm hoping like at the very latest the last ones will be getting shipped then. My goal is also to get my international ones shipped a wee bit earlier um, this year because I know some of them did take some time getting to their recipients last year. So don't want to have that happen again if I can avoid it. Um, so yeah, mainly that's what I'm doing most of my work time with. Um, and then my other goal is to get my reciprocal shawl pattern published sometime this week, hopefully by the 31st. I just wanted to take a few nicer pictures of it um, now that the weather's turned cold, but now it's raining, so I can't do that. <laughs> so anyway, it's coming. All right, that's it. I hope you are doing well. I would love to hear what you're working on, um, how you're spending Halloween. Are you doing anything fun? Um, yeah, let me know. Please comment below. I always enjoy reading your comments, and I try to reply to them in as timely a fashion as possible. So anyway, we will talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Take care.